Hi, I'm Lorne Cardinal, and the book I've chosen for Great Canadian Books is by author Joseph Boyden. It's entitled Three Day Road. Now the book starts simply enough. A woman, an Ojibwe woman named Nishka, who's lived in the bush all her life, canoes upriver into a small northern town to pick up one of her two nephews returning from World War I. And the nephew who comes back is broken physically and spiritually and has many demons of his own. I lead nephew down to the river bank. I have left the canoe a good walk down the rocky shore. I tell him that it is best for him to wait while I go ahead and get it. He doesn't respond. He just sits heavily on the bank. Quickly as I can, I make my way. I am silly to worry about leaving him alone for a few minutes. In the last years, he has experienced more danger than anyone should experience in a hundred lives. But I worry anyway. As I approach him in my canoe, I can see that he has his jacket off and is holding his thin arm in one hand. I get closer and see that he has stuck something into his arm. Something he pulls out just as he looks up and sees me. His body has gone relaxed and his eyes look guilty for a moment. But as I get to where he is, they are like the dark river in the sun. Three Day Road, in essence, is the story of two Canadian natives, Elijah and Xavier, best friends who go to the insanity of World War I, where they become fantastically successful as snipers. But because they're living in insanity, they suffer a form of insanity themselves. They are destroyed, or at very least ruined, and one of them has to stumble back to Canada in some hope of regaining his composure, regaining his life. We do not get far before the sun lets me know that it is time to prepare camp. I want to go easy with him anyway. No rush. It is summer. The insects are heaviest just before and during dusk, and so I look for an island in the river that will afford us some relief from them. Ahead, a good one appears with a sandy beach and dead wood scattered about for a fire. We beach the canoe and I busy myself collecting wood. Nephew tries to help, but his crutches sink into the soft sand and he grows frustrated. I want to cry, watching him from the corner of my eye as he bends and tries to pick up wood and then finally sits and pulls rocks to him slowly, making a fire circle. I cut long saplings with my axe and drag them to him, tie them together at one end and construct the frame for a small teepee. I pull a length of canvas from the canoe and tie it to the frame. The sky right now looks like it will give a starry night, but the wind tells me something different. We are not so far away from the bay that a storm can't rush upon us. Once I have dragged our few belongings into the teepee, I pull food from my pack and lay it out. Nephew has gotten a nice fire started. On one rock, I place salted fish. On another, some moose meat. And on a third, blueberries picked fresh from the bush. I take a stick and sharpen its end. Nephew stares at the river. I lace a length of meat onto the stick and heat it by the flame. He turns his head in recognition when it begins to warm and its scent comes up. I've not smelled that in a long time, he says, smiling shyly. These are the first words he has said since the town. Many of us enjoy reading about World War I, However, with, with Boyden's book, all of these characters are first characters, flesh and blood, and we go through their childhoods and we go through some of their deaths with them. And it's the power of the human story that makes the research come to life and makes the research have a profound effect on us. We see it as something that is still affecting us into the future. One of the many things I love about Joseph Boyden's Three Day Road is the fact that he introduces us to two Aboriginal warriors, our heroes Xavier and Elijah, who were raised in the bush of Northern Ontario. And we meet them first as 12-year-old children, innocent, hunters, survivors. And then he brings them into the killing fields of Europe. Elijah has killed more men already than I can count on both hands. 
It doesn't seem to bother him. Me? I've killed no one that I could see yet, but I've helped Elijah. I don't think it bothers me, but I won't let myself think of it. Just push it away whenever it appears. Elijah smiles and stares out into the black. The guns in the south cause the sky there to glow and pulse. They are the northern lights in the wrong place, reminding me of home. The line across from us is still. The only noise over the booming in the distance is the muttering and cries of the wounded soldier. I'll be back, Elijah whispers to me and crawls out of our listening post quick and silent. I know it's useless to try and stop him. I also see that Elijah has left his rifle behind. Staying still, I listen and try to fight off the anger that comes to me when Elijah does these stupid things. It isn't fair. I'm left here like a worried wife wondering if Elijah's going to make it back this time or if he will be spotted and shot. I hear the wounded soldier suddenly cry out what sounds like, Nine! 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 And then in a lower voice, he begins to speak as if carrying on a conversation with someone. Finally, he stops talking. I sit and listen for a long time, the emptiness of the night striking me now that the wounded voice is silent. When the sun begins to threaten and I am sick with worry that Elijah will not get back in time or at all, and I will be forced to squat in this hole all day until night comes again, and I can make it back to the line. Elijah slithers into the crater and leans back on it, breathing shallow and a little hard. Where were you? I ask in Cree, trying not to sound upset, the tone slipping out anyway. I helped that soldier find his way to the spirit world, Elijah whispers. We must get back before the sun comes up, I say. I was good to him, Elijah continues, staring up into the sky. He'd suffered enough, and I didn't want him to leave violently, so I covered his mouth and nose with my own hand and whispered good things to him till he went. Enough! I say sharper than I want to, and crawl out of the crater and toward our line. The character Nishka is the story's caregiver to the young nephews, both when they were children and when they come back from war. Uh, but she also is going through her own struggles while the boys are st struggling to survive in France. In this passage, she has just finished having a relationship with a Frenchman. You are nothing special, just another squaw whore. I took your power away in this place and sent it to burn in hell where it belongs. Suddenly I felt my guts churn and only knew that I needed to be out of this place. The too strong smell of cedar made my head pound so that I needed to throw up. I jumped up and on shaky legs ran towards the door. It felt like forever, but finally I reached it and flung it open, the contents of my stomach rushing up and spewing onto the steps below me. I fell to my knees, but heard his boots approaching from behind. I reached for my knife under my belt, but realized that I did not wear it with these white clothes. Pushing myself to my knees, I ran fast as I could towards the river, expecting any moment to hear his footsteps catching up with me to feel his hands grabbing at me. I made it down to the river, my head pounding, my mouth dry and sour, the world around me spinning. I looked back to see if he followed, but all I could make out in the darkness was the blunt block of the school on the ridge overlooking the river and the tall arm of the church stretching up into the night sky. I crouched and sobbed, afraid that his magic had killed my family's fire inside of me. It was only then that I realized that he was a spellcaster of some kind and he'd stolen my strength. The stink of their tobacco and drink, and especially of him, wafted up from the clothes that I wore so that I thought my head would split. I stood and tore them from me, ripped every stitch away from my skin and flung the material into the river. And finally, I stood naked under the moon, my head back and my mouth open, the howling of a hurt animal constricting my throat. Falling on all fours, I drank deeply from the river to ease the burning in my throat and my pounding head. Then I stood shakily and began to run. I ran along the riverbank, not caring about the sting of bushes on my naked thighs, about the sharp rocks under my feet or the branches of the trees that hung low. 
I ran until I closed in on my little camp and my canoe. I ran fast enough to try to catch up with what I'd lost back there. I did not want to wait till morning, but began to paddle my canoe immediately, and I did not stop paddling until I reached my home, keeping up my strength by vowing a thousand times never to return to that place. The fear that he really had taken my power from me chased me all the way down the river. I slept long and deep as my head touched the floor of my lodge. When I awoke, I knew what I had to do. Choosing the stones carefully from the riverbank, I heated them up in a fire for a full day as I carefully constructed a lodge according to my father's directions. Round after round, I opened the flap to that small place and crawled inside, poured water on the rocks so that the steam became a living, burning thing, and prayed to the four directions and to the earth, the sky, the water, and the air, pouring more water onto the rocks until I thought my lungs would catch fire. I prayed harder for purification until the pain became ecstasy. And when I completed the last round, I crawled out of the lodge and collapsed on the cool ground, the world around me a fresh and clean place again. The character of Niska is memorable for a number of reasons. Uh, one is that we really get to experience the northern Canadian bush through her eyes. She lives in the bush for most of the year uh, and has since she was quite young. And so we really get to see that very unique landscape and to learn about how she's able to survive. Her hunting, uh, her collecting of herbs and medicines. She's also a medicine woman. One of the joys of Three Day Road is reading the meticulous research that Joseph Boyden puts into his novel. Not only does he cover what it's like to be a native person in northern Ontario around Moose Factory, but also the excruciating detail that he goes into in the trenches in Europe. Elijah and I don't like to complain like the others, but focus our energy on staying alive and finding the little comforts. Wait out the autumn and avoid the shells that scream in randomly from the gray sky. We wear the tall moccasins I made for us a long time ago back in Canada. They dry quickly and allow our feet to breathe, and in this way we avoid foot trouble. The moccasins are the one break in dress code that McCain will allow. Just don't let Breach see him, he says. Trench raids against Fritz are impossible right now, as they are too well dug in and even night patrols are rare in this weather. The mud and water hold the Canadians captive. We dig deeper into it and await what winter will bring. I am sick of the corpses around us. But in his boredom, Elijah volunteers for burial duty. Taking the dead out of the line and down the dangerous alleys of support trenches that are constantly bombarded stacking the corpses in rows like cordwood and helping with the digging of graves. It isn't all that difficult in this soft muck, he says. They try to bury the dead out of range of Fritz's guns so that they won't be disturbed again. Elijah goes through the dead men's pockets and takes out coins and combs, pictures of wives and girlfriends and children, Christian medallions to help ward off death, letters from home and letters not yet sent, billfolds, knots of hair, baby teeth, bullets, cigarette cases and lambskins, morphine pills and wedding rings and baptismal certificates and prayer cards and maps and wills and poems. Elijah places these things in envelopes and marks the name of the owners on them and brings them in piles to the officer. Before he leaves the corpse, Elijah tells me he has taken to opening each man's eyes and staring into them, then closing them with his calloused right hand, letting a strange spark of warmth accumulate deep in his gut each time that he does it, noting the color of the iris, knowing that he, Elijah, is the last thing that each will see before being placed into the cold mud and water here, before they go to their place. Elijah, he says, the sparks fill his belly when it gnaws for food. The reason I picked Three Day Road uh, was because a member of my family was involved in World War II. And I remember 
uh, my great uncle George Cunningham telling me and my brother stories about his time there. And the thing that sparked me about this book was I love the way how Joseph brings our characters from the bush of northern Ontario in a very traditional lifestyle, uh, living in harmony with the animals and the environment and understanding it and respecting it. And then taking those two, our two young heroes and putting them into the insanity of World War I and how they learned to survive by hanging on to what they have, but also by learning how to survive in a foreign country and doing whatever it took to get back home. It's a chilling, it's a chilling reality of what Native people go through in this country, learning how to adapt and yet retain our identity as well. And these characters here are, are fantastically fleshed out, three-dimensional. One of the great things about Three Day Road is that it reminds me of um, Bolero, the music Bolero, which is just a few bars repeated again and again and again with rising intensity. In this novel, you know what's going to happen. You know that the two young men going to war are going to be turned into monsters. You can see it coming from the very beginning. And yet it's interesting and it's compelling. And it's like watching the Titanic approach an iceberg. You're, oh my God, I can't bear to watch, but I can't bear to look away. The beautiful thing about Joseph's writing is that he uses metaphor and parallels throughout his book. And he dwells just briefly on the talk of freedom, of Aboriginal veterans feeling for the first time like they were human beings equal to all others. And also the reality that that ceases to exist when they return home. But our two characters now have come to a point where they totally realize they are on two separate paths. In the long hours of hunting, Elijah tries to understand what is growing in him. He talks to me about this through the nights we spend out in the damp and mud. Mist rises from craters and swirls in the stink. In the end, the answer that comes is simple. Elijah has learned to take pleasure in killing. Elijah says that something in me has hardened in the last months. I talk even less than before, do not smile at all anymore. He knows that I want to be home, that I am sick of all this. But he tells me I must realize that the freedom of this place will not present itself again. But this freedom he talks about, this freedom to kill, is a choice I no longer want. Three Day Road is a necessary novel. Uh, beyond being an interesting novel, beyond being a good novel, it's a necessary novel because it shines a spotlight on a part of history that we're forgetting, namely the First World War, because it's a war that belongs to our grandparents or great-grandparents. It's beginning to fade away. But it shines a light on it in a fresh way, in a new way, as if from a different direction. Because what did it mean to be native at the time? And what it did it mean to be native? And consider this for a moment. To be native, to have been destroyed, in effect, by white people, and then to go into their war to fight for them. It's a strange kind of point of view to take, and a fascinating one, and a necessary one. Now, this is one of my favorite passages in Three Day Road. It's Nishka talking to her struggling nephew, who's struggling with addictions. And she is trying to heal them the way that Native people have healed themselves for centuries, not sure through spirit, song, and ceremony. And in this passage, she's telling her struggling nephew a story. When the sun had passed its low winter zenith and there was still no sign of Auntie, you heard a great racket arise in the dense forest ahead, a noise you'd never heard before. You were sure you'd stumble across a windigo. It sounded like feet stamping in snow, like many people whistling to one another and rustling dead tree branches. When you realized there was nothing else you could do, you redrew your bow and crawled up to the clearing where the noise came from. In the midst of it, on a bare pine, the needles long fallen off, stood the biggest grouse you'd ever seen. Wings spread, its voice calling out. Below it, there was a circle of other grouse, 30 or 40 of them at least moving in unison around the tree. 
you remember how they danced side by side, around and around, the big grouse calling out, leading them? How you watched transfixed so that you lost track of time. And then something amazing happened. The big grouse stopped beating his wings, called out, and the other grouse immediately stopped, ruffled their feathers so that they appeared to grow twice their size, then started dancing again, but in the other direction. You'd never seen anything like it in your life. Nobody would believe such a thing, a bird dance in the forest. As you watched, their pattern reminded you of something else you'd seen before, out of the eyesight of the watchful nuns. Your own people gathering in summer to celebrate an easy season. A tradition they carried on despite the stern words of the Muniao church. You stared at these birds dancing in the snow, the sunlight reflecting in it in thousands of tiny ice crystals. You saw in their movement the movement of your own people as they traveled from winter to summer to winter again, dancing through the years. You saw for the first time the circle. Even though you could not yet express it in words, you understood the seasons, the teepee, the shaking tent, the wigwam, the fire circle, the mahta tusuin. You saw all life is in the circle and you realize that you always come back in one way or another to where you have been before. That is just a little bit of magic that Boyden weaves into Three Day Road and I guarantee you, you will enjoy it and you will understand why Three Day Road is one of our great Canadian books. Thank you.